So let's call this meeting to order. It's, I can't even see that. Yeah. 6.42 maybe? Yeah. Do you actually you want to come up and sit at the table? We can have more of a discussion. Or you, whatever's comfortable for you because get you the info that you want. I'm, I'm pretty good right here with my Okay. Chair. Well, okay. The other other aspect too is that the the folks on uh, Orca, there are a lot of folks that that actually watch things um, on the video, um, which is which is funny because it prevents them from coming in, which would be fun to have the the, the more dialogue. But at least they get the information. Right. Uh, actually, and I may show my eyesight's a little better, so a little closer to what I'm talking about here. So, what we're looking at is the budget for next year, so 2019-2020. Um, and a lot of the purpose of this presentation is for folks to be informed um, when they go to vote on March 5th, is making sure that uh, folks know why we're asking what we're asking, uh, what goals we attempt to accomplish uh, should the budget pass. And just to make sure also that um, people have a pretty solid idea of what the overall impact on their tax burden is going to be, um, which we'll throw up here towards, towards the end. To do that, it's probably important to take a look at where we've been, you know, what we did with, with last year's budget, and there's, there's quite a bit. And this list is not exhaustive. Um, so one of the big focuses last year uh, was safety. Uh, we did a big climate survey. We talked with the community, especially after some of the tragedies that happened out in the greater world. Um, so we spent a significant amount of time and money making sure that we hardened all the access points to the schools. Um, we spent a lot of time, and we're still in that process of training all of the staff um, in Alice. Um, our chosen preferred method of responding to an emergency um, if and should one happen. The emergency processes and the safety protocols that go along with that are being updated. Uh, they have a pretty good setup right now, uh, but what is happening is, is the teachers are going through these drills. Um, they have a feedback form that they fill out um, and provide back to the cabinet level team so that we can kind of adjust the protocols and the procedures based upon you know what they're experiencing themselves and any concerns that they kind of bring up along the way. Um, we created a full day preschool at Braintree. Um, we improved the district's capacity to deliver effective mathematics instruction and that was K to eight. Um, all the elementary teachers had the opportunity to and most did uh, participate in two full graduate courses. Um, the first one was on the eight standards for mathematical practice and that is about teaching the mathematical mindset to students. Um, which the research shows if you use these eight practices as part of the common core, um, the students learn better and they retain longer. Um, so they were all engaged in that. And they also did the first 20 days of math um, course. And that one really focused on working with the students in small groups um, on standard-based lessons um, because there's a lot of good thinking and good learning that goes on when the students are working in small groups and they're talking about how they approached a problem, how they solved it, and they get to work together to argue with each other and defend their points, and it's, it's, it's uh, very effective in terms of teaching math. Um, the other thing that was added last year as part of the budget was track my progress, uh, making sure that the teachers had a tool um, that was very specific that they could use with the students that would inform the teachers how well the students were doing on each of the standards and objectives uh, that the students were trying, the teachers were trying to get across to them, um, and then use that information to go back and adjust what they're doing with the kids. So identify weaknesses and find better ways of connecting with the kids to improve those weaknesses. Um, we did create a high school program last year um, to mitigate trauma-based behaviors at the high school level. Um, so we have an adjustment counselor and we have a behavioral interventionist there that work together uh, to work with the high school students that are kind of at the moderate level in terms of trauma-based behaviors. Uh, digital literacy um, is a focus that's happening right now. Um, that curriculum is in development. The librarians are meeting with me um, and we are putting together a K-12 curriculum. Once that document is complete, uh, the next step will be sitting down with the different departments, the different disciplines across the district, and getting their input on where these pieces of this digital literacy curriculum fit in to what they do in their everyday classroom um, so that we can expand it 
um, and so that we can make sure that what is being taught is actually being used in the daily work of the kids um, to reinforce it. Um, special education department right now, um, that's a lot of the focus for this year with the trauma-based work, uh, is developing the means to assess students' progress. The goal of special education is not to permanently put accommodations on a student. The goal is to provide them with accommodations and teach them the skills so eventually, if possible, they are able to come off their IEPs. So to do that, it's kind of just like uh, they do with teaching. They need a means to determine the impact that they are having on the students that they are working with. Um, and so they are in that process right now. They've got a pretty good idea um, in terms of how they're pulling that together. Um, we also moved in the last, last budget round uh, any of the critical personnel. We took them off the grant funded um, pieces because the grant funds are not always assured. These folks are critical. Um, these are our coaches, our technology director. Um, and if those grants dry up, we're out those people. Um, we need them especially now for the work that we're doing trying to reach the ends, um, especially in terms of ELA and mathematics. Uh, so we wanted to assure that they would always be here for us. Um, in terms of facilities, there is an extensive amount of work that's been done over the last year. Um, tremendous amount of work in terms of the plumbing systems across the schools. Um, we also replaced quite a few of the water heaters and the storage tanks. We did extensive work on the HVAC systems across all the schools. We completed the fence at Brookfield. We did the well reclamation at Brookfield as well, um, which actually was affected, effective until the lead problems um, cropped up, so we were in the process of working on those. Um, we've got a composting agreement in place and up and running across the school so that we're meeting the requirements of state law um, as a producer in our cafeterias of compostable materials. Um, and we are working, we've got pretty much phase one um, of the work done in the Raven building uh, replacement project. Um, and we've been talking a little bit about in the board piece that you know we're switching around a little bit because the cost ended up being twice what we were originally projecting it to be. Um, so that work is underway right now as well. They will be in the warehouse um, that we've got that's set up, um, that's got the office space in the back um, for next year. Um, and then a lot of the work was done around ensuring compliance uh, with asbestos as well as co copper and lead water testing. Further, um, we had the creation of the makerspace at RUHS, which is great for um, all students. Um, but it really allows the critical thinking aspect of, of the more advanced students. We have an industrial laser cutter in there. I mean, they can make projects yay big. That thing will cut glass and it will cut plexiglass and wood. Um, a, lot of, a lot of learning goes on in, in deciding how, how the projects are going to be created, especially because a lot of them are, are three-dimensional projects. How do I make this piece so that it fits together with this piece so that it comes together and how do I program it? program that into the system. And they've also got the 3D printers. Um, so there's a lot of work that's happening down there right now. That program is still expanding. Um, and a lot of it is, is strongly connected with uh, Ken Cadow and the PBL work um, that he is doing. He's been fantastic with that. Um, we had the creation of the Advanced Manufacturing Program at RTCC. We had the addition of an athletic trainer um, to make sure that our students that are getting injured are getting the help and, and getting um, the services they need to get back out on the field as quickly as possible. We also created an athletic trainer's office with everything that that person needs to do their work. Um, we relocated the agricultural program um, onto, the R onto the RTCC grounds over by the, uh, the soccer fields. Um, a lot of that was to help out with the time on learning with those students, they were having to travel out to the field in Braintree um, each day, so they'd lose time on learning due to the travel out and then the travel back each day. And then we purchased two buses to increase enrollment and accessibility um, for school choice uh, students. Um, bus that goes over to Chelsea and the bus that does the rounds through uh, Rochester, Stockbridge, and Bethel. Now, Typically, in terms of building a budget, um, we go to our data and we take a look at what stands out to us when we do that, and because it usually helps us identify the problems, the things that we need to address um, in the coming years. And the data that we were looking at, um, particularly over the course of this last year, that's guiding our budget decisions for the coming year, 
um, was academic, right? Our performance against the board's ends, um, our enrollment. So these are the changes in our student populations over time, our overall enrollment as well as our, our subgroups, and then what our budget history has been. And so part of this presentation is to talk a little bit about what we were seeing in each of those areas and then kind of pulling it together with what the strategy is, what it is that we were trying to accomplish uh, based upon what we've learned. Um, math proficiency, a little discussion of the numbers. 2016 met the proficiency threshold. So in 2016 here in this district, the grade three students, 67% of them met the proficiency threshold in mathematics. Right? Grade four, 43% did, grade five, 40% did. It compares it each year with what the state of Vermont was doing. And then the number down here is giving you an average. So if you take these numbers and average them together and weight the average based upon how many students are in grade three and grade four, that's what this number is. So it gives you an idea of how we compare um, to the state of Vermont across each of those three years. So I'll give a second for folks to look at that. Any questions on the data before I flip over to the graph and talk about why it's important? You guys have seen some of this before too, so but if you've got other, other stuff that comes up. So I chose 2017 for the math because um, it's pretty indicative of what the other years look like. What this graph is showing you is in 2006, uh, to, excuse me, 2017, we took the third graders, you know, the percent that hit proficiency, the fourth graders, the fifth graders, the sixth graders, um, that hit those proficiency thresholds and where they were, what level they were at when they hit it, and plotted them out, and you see a pretty distinct pattern there. And the pattern is, is that as these students are going through their years, right, as they're advancing through the grades over time, fewer and fewer and fewer of them are meeting the proficiency threshold. So their ability in mathematics is decreasing over time. And it doesn't matter what year that we look at, even when I went back to the years that we were using NECAP, this is the pattern. The slope of the line may be a little bit different, right? A little, little less steep, a little steeper, but this is the overall pattern. And the other thing that was interesting um, is it didn't matter if we've looked at the data in terms of same cohort or cross cohorts. So in this case, this is a cross cohort graph. In other words, these are third graders, these are fourth graders, same year, they're not the same kids. If I took the third graders and watched them over the course of time and plotted where they were in fourth grade and fifth grade and sixth grade, it's the same pattern. Um, so there's some important info there that we'll get back to in just a minute. The other thing that's important to recognize um, in the data that was important when it popped up is what is happening with our big subgroup. Our big subgroup is students with disabilities, students that are on IEPs. And you can see in mathematics, you've got the same pattern. Things are dropping, um, but they're dropping faster. So these guys over the course of time are struggling more and more um, than the regular population of students. Um, questions? So that's just third through sixth grade, huh? Third, third through sixth, and the reason being is because on the grades beyond that, none of them are reaching proficiency. Okay. Typically, that is what happens. So as they, go up, as they go up through the years, they're getting these dramatic drops, and all of a sudden, they're at zero. And each year after that, they're pretty much at zero. Or you might get one student out of the, that, that group that passes. Um, so that's the reason the others went on there. English language proficiency, same setup. And when we throw the graph up there, there is a very big distinction between the two in terms of what it looks like. Okay, so give folks a minute to take a look at the numbers that are there. And again, set up the same way that the math was. And here we're actually, we're pretty close to, to you know, what the state average is in ELA for the most part. A little low, sometimes a, little, a point above. Um, technically, um, it takes three points um, to be statistically significant on, on most of these types of, of, of tests and this type of data. Now, graph-wise, with ELA, something a little bit different is going on. These are the same third graders, same fourth graders, same fifth graders that we saw in mathematics, right? This is ELA 2017. 
Um, in terms of the time that I've spent in classrooms, especially at the beginning of the year, kind of watching what's going on, we have very talented teachers. Um, yes, ELA has spent a little bit more time um, developing the curriculum, especially at the elementary level than the math folks have, um, but I don't think that's what the real impact is that we're seeing here. So for some reason, ELA is doing all right. You know, I'd like to see it a little higher, um, but they're actually growing a little bit on the trend line year after year. So then the question becomes, is why is there a difference between ELA and mathematics? And you can see that the same thing is kind of true um, with the students with disability in the English language arts. They're dropping a little bit. Um, the line looks a lot steeper than it actually is, but nothing compared to how fast the mathematics was dropping. And so, in terms of kind of pulling the data together, um, in terms of all the discussions the cabinet has had, the principals have had, um, in terms of their discussions with the faculty, in terms of all of us seeing what's going on with the kids, um, we are contributing what we are seeing to the growth of trauma-based behaviors uh, in our students over time. And I'll show you some data that shows, shows that growth a little bit. Why? Why does this data kind of indicate that this is due to trauma-based behaviors? Well, if we think a little bit about trauma-based behaviors, what they are, um, right? Autonomic behaviors that were created to protect the student from ongoing trauma, typically happening in the household and the world outside of school. Um, these students have learned protective mechanisms. Um, they've learned them at a level of, of the hippocampus in the brain, which means that it's an automatic response. They have no control and they cannot rationalize um, it away. It just happens. Um, the hippocampus and the amygdala are in there. They screen the information, the sensory information that is coming in from the outside world. And if any of that sensory information matches something that was traumatic in the past, all of a sudden all the alarm bells in the body go off. Um, the fight, flight, or freeze response kicks in and then the students are going to be out of control in one way or another until somebody comes in and sues them and gets them to regulate again. Now in terms of our school, uh, typically what we see the students that fight, those are really obvious at the elementary level. Um, they get angry, they get violent, they yell, they scream, they throw things. Um, at the high school level you don't see that because at those kids at that size we can't keep them here. Um, those are students that end up in outplacement. Um, in terms of the flight, um, I can't recall how many times two of the elementary principals were out looking for a student that ran last year. A significant amount of time, almost on a daily basis. The students, something would happen. It could be just a simple change in a tone of voice. It could be a stranger um, in the classroom, a person they hadn't seen before. A um, person could drop a book. That's all it takes when that system kicks in and those students would lit literally run. Um, and then we also have the students that freeze and those, at least to me, are, are the saddest. Um, most of them were put in situations um, when they were younger that they couldn't get out of. They couldn't run, they couldn't fight. And so what they do is they disassociate. And so on the extreme level, we don't have any of these that I've seen, which is good, is they can become catatonic. Um, but in most cases, what they will do with that disassociation looks like is they're kind of dreamy and spaced out. And they're not really with it. You can't really connect with them about what's going on. Why is all this important? Well, for two reasons. One, if the kids are getting triggered um, that, that have these issues, um, they're not available for learning while they're triggered. Okay. Can't, can't learn. Um, if your emergency systems in your body are on overdrive. Um, and in the case of the, the fight and the flight students, um, when those students act out, when that trigger hits, it takes the whole classroom with them, um, at least for a short amount of time. Um, it's a little bit more problematic up at Brookfield, which we'll talk, talk about, um, but it may take you know five or 10 minutes if the student is able to get removed from the room. Um, uh, to get the rest of the class calmed down and kind of refocused. And then if you have other students that have trauma-based issues in the classroom, if one student gets triggered, those behaviors can trigger others. Um, and so you get kind of a cascade effect. Now, 
not available to learning if they're triggered. And the other sad part of this is the fact that the students are aware, for the most part, that the behaviors aren't normal. And so they spend a tremendous amount of time um, and mental resources trying to make sure that they are in control when they can be. And if they are focusing that hard on making sure that they're in control, those mental resources are not available for learning. And so we go back to this idea of why, why does this data, why might this data kind of support this conclusion that it's trauma-based behaviors? Aside of the fact that we see them every day and we know the impact that they're having, well, mathematics is a foundational discipline. If you don't learn really well what happened in third grade, that's going to hinder you in fourth grade. And if you don't learn what you need to in fourth grade, that's going to hinder you even more in fifth grade because it builds on itself. ELA, while it does build on itself a bit, you can do quite well in 10th grade ELA if you fail ninth grade ELA. The foundational pieces, those, those building blocks that you have to build on, um, happen in a more generalized way in, in ELA than they do in mathematics. So the, the guess is it has not a lot to do with um, the curriculum or the teaching. Uh, there is some work that needs to be done there, but the reason that we're seeing this impact is because of these trauma-based behaviors, and it's significant. Um, on average, by the time our students get to whatever the grade the terminal testing is in, used to be 11th grade, it's now 9, only 10% of them are hitting the proficiency level in math, and that's been historic um, for quite a while. They had one year where I think it got up to 25, but typically for whatever reason it sat at 10 or 11 percent. So there's, there's some work there that needs to be done. Um, take a look at some other things that are going on in the district that help control the budget. Um, enrollment going up is always a good thing um, because the more students that come in, the more money that we get from the state. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the total cost of the budget uh, towards the end of the presentation. But if you take a look at our, our three-year trend, this is district as a whole. Um, on average, we're going up by 11.5 students per year, which is pretty good. And that trend should continue at least for another year or two. Um, we had a huge jump last year. We went from 800 to about 855. So we had about a 55-student increase across the district, and that does not include the preschoolers um, that, that we got last year. Um, if you take a look at uh, the number of students that are on IEP, students with disability, as a percent of the total enrollment in the district, you can see that that is increasing as well. Now, this is not plotted the same way the other is. This is percent of the total student population that's on, on IEP. So in 2017, if you look at all the kids in the district, a little over 18% were on IEPs. You get to 2019, overall in the district, it's a little over 20%. So it is increasing. And the other thing, um, again, it's not definitive, but it gives you a pretty good idea of what's going to happen in the future. When those data points are close together like that, falling right on the trend line, it usually means that things are going to continue, at least for a little while, um, in that direction. So we can expect those to go up. Brookfield enrollment, um, just because this is about the district as a whole, um, Brookfield enrollment has jumped up and down. It's actually higher than this data. This data was pulled in October. It's going up. In fact, I expect this data point and this data point to line up with the data point that comes in next year, um, based upon the students that are, that are in kindergarten. Um, so overall enrollment is expected to increase um, at least for one more year in Brookfield. Um, Brookfield special education enrollment has been increasing. Right? It's increasing across the district. It's probably increasing at, at most of the schools, and it certainly is. And Brookfield um, has 26% of its students um, in that school are currently on IEPs. And that growth, the current growth that we're seeing um, in terms of the students on IEPs, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them are our students with trauma. Um, and those students take up a tremendous amount of resources. Brain tree enrollments, brain tree is going up like crazy. They're actually, they are actually quite far and above this. They're over 90 at this point in time um, in brain tree. Their special education population is growing as well. Um, they're at, a, again, a little over 21%. Randolph Elementary School, um, their enrollment, they are growing as well. They're getting about nine new kids a year. 
Um, they have been for a couple of years now, um, which is good. But again, there's special education. The number of students on IEPs is growing as well. Um, so they're up around 20%. Now, to kind of put things in perspective, um, in terms of special education, I actually pulled the data, I think it was from the Center of Disease Control, which was interesting. They, they plotted this type of data. Um, on average, across the United States, 12% of a district's students are students with IEPs. So we're running close to twice the national average. On average, across the United States, of the IEP students in a district, 0.7% of them are students with emotional disturbances, these trauma-based trauma students that we're talking about. Um, I don't have an exact number to put on ours at this point in time, other than to say it is significantly greater than 0.7%. Are we over-identifying kids? And that's part of one of the reasons, um, you're going to see this as one of our goals for next year, is to take a look. Um, there are some students that I'm concerned about um, that may be over-accommodated. Um, I have to sit down and do some more detailed analysis with folks to take a look at it. Um, but there is a, that may be a part of it. Um, by the same token, what leads me to believe that while there may be some over-identification, um, it's not as great as we think it could be because of the results of the students with disabilities on those, those tests, right? They drop them like a rock. Typically, if you have students that are over-identified, those scores are higher, right? Because those are students that don't need it. They're going to perform well with or without those services, so you, so you would expect them to be higher. So it doesn't mean it's not happening. I've seen, I've seen at least uh, two or three cases where it has in the research that I've done this year. But it is something that we have to look at. Uh, enrollment at the high school took a huge drop, but it's rebounded completely, and it is expected, again, to go up. Um, at least one more year. Um, we've got Tunbridge. And what is the, the, so we've got Chelsea, we've got Tunbridge. Who's on this side? Washington. Washington. So we've had a lot of interest from Tunbridge students and Washington students. Um, and because we already send the bus out to Chelsea, um, it's, there's a good, good chance that we're going to get quite a few more students next year um, in terms of school choice. Now it's interesting here. Oop, let's go back a little bit. RUHS enrollment, their special education population is going down. And I actually did delve a little bit deeper into these numbers. Um, it's because those students are in outplacements. The outplacements are not part of their numbers. So there are some that are being remediated because we do have a lot of students um, that are on uh, what I call an academic IEP. Right? They just need help with the academics. That's the root of the problem. Um, there's a processing problem in academics. Um, and some of them are, are, are moderate to minor, so over the course of time they do learn the skills, they come off the IEPs. But a lot of this is, is that the students are you know, making it through the elementary years, they're getting up to the high school, and then they're too big to deal with those behaviors, um, so they're ending up getting something. How many kids do we place out? At the high school and middle school level? Uh, I, I'd have to go and pull the numbers to be specific for you, um, but I can give you an indication of the cost. I can think of five right now that, of those five, the cost to educate them in outplacement is probably close to a million bucks. Um, to put it but in. I mean, those, those are kids we can't educate anyway, so we have to um, place them out. Depends. Um, some of the students, and this is an, another piece that's uh, part that's growing um, in our population right now that we may have to take a, a very serious look at. Um, we have some students um, on the autism spectrum that are severe. Um, those you really need a specialized place to do that. Um, if you get a lot of students, we're up to about 15 that are on the spectrum right now. Um, you know, it may be more cost effective to bring a, build a program here. Um, and so, but that's a, that's a, a future discussion. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's interesting to kind of watch and kind of see, um, but. The biggest issue that we've got is the, the population of the really high need students with emotional disabilities is growing. And I wonder of the ones that we are sending out right now, um, as severe as they are, had we had the therapeutic program when they were little kids, um, when they were coming up through the elementary school, they may not have ended up where they did. 
Um, that's that's you know really one of the goals here. Or the services that, that they need um, at this point in time, had they had that therapeutic program, may, may have been much less severe than, than what they've got now. Because typically with trauma, especially if it's continuing, if you don't have resiliency, if you don't learn those skills, if you don't learn to manage it on the outside, if you don't have social connections with people because the behaviors that go with trauma often sever those, um, things just get worse over time. All right, so talk a little bit about enrollment. We've talked a little bit about academics, you know, the data that we're looking at to kind of drive this, this budget process, um, which is our main tool for addressing um, what we need to focus on uh, in the coming year. Um, was also taking a look a little bit historically um, at what's happened with the budget itself. And this is an idealized picture. It's not quite exactly what's going on, but it represents um, the overall effect of the conservative uh, budget that we've had for at least a decade, if not more. Um, if you pretend for a moment that the overall district budget is a million dollars, the majority um, of that budget goes to salaries. In most districts, it's anywhere from 70 to, to, to 93, 94 percent um, of the, the total use of the budget goes to personnel salaries. Um, if you take a look at this budget, right, million dollars for the budget total, 700,000 is going into salaries. That leaves us 300,000 left over to do what it is that schools and district do, which is maintain their facilities, which is uh, supply the resources to run programs and make sure that the teachers have the supplies to do the work that it is that they do. In a level funded system, this number never changes. And I've actually worked in, in, in a level funded system before. Um, and what happens is because this number never changes, but salaries go up every year in this district, it's traditionally about 3% that they go up. The amount that you have left overall to do all the work that you need to do on behalf of the students decreases over time. Um, and in this model, you can see that after 10 years has gone by, we've got about a third um, of what we started with in terms of trying to maintain programs and working with students. Not only that, but the cost of living goes up every year. So this 100000 here is worth less significantly than 100000 there. Right. But I do have to say that because we were losing population, mm -hmm. right, we did decrease the amount of staffing. Yeah. Right? And when you decrease the amount of staffing, obviously the salary levels go down. I understand what you're saying in, in general, you know, but I do have to... You know, say that that's yep. not quite accurate. I mean, but again, this is like did, I said, this is idealized. This we would is have not... been irresponsible if we had not, you know, s decreased the size of our staff yep. um, because you know we lost quite a few kids, like hundreds, over those ten years. Yep. You know, just because that's what's happening throughout Vermont, and so that's one reason you know that we have been able to, you know, be fiscally responsible and you know, not have the high student-teacher um, ratio, teacher-student ratio that many districts have, you know, that they have too much staff. So, so again, I mean, I understand what you're saying. Idealized. Some of that's definitely true, but I do think that, you know, we were being responsible in... Oh, I mean, this is not a criticism. I mean, level funding is a model, and, and, well, and I'm not saying it's, it's inappropriate. I, I'm... I'm, I'm the, I'm not advocating for level spending, but I am yeah. saying that it, it is important to see in, in put it in perspective that we did need to lose some staffing, or that would have been, you know, also yeah. irresponsible. And the, but, and the, but the purpose of the exercise is really to kind of see the effect. And kind of when I was looking back, what was typically going on was the overall budget was increasing. It was increasing typically around between one, you know, one, 1.3, 1 1.5% per year. But again, with the exception of the few years where things were tight, um, staff salaries were increasing by 3%. And overall net effect is that this went down. Now, enrollment does play a huge part, which is why I keep talking about the enrollment and trying to build it, build it up. Every student that we get that moves into town is worth $10,666 to us. Every student that we get through school choice is worth almost $17,000 to us. Um, so that piece, that building the enrollment, 
um, is important because the more that goes up, the more money that we have, the less we have to get from the town as a whole, the towns as a whole. Um, and typically, it allows you to begin building programs that more people want. So more people move in and you get this nice positive cycle going on. And that's a good part of the focus of, of this budget as well. You know, we are working with the trauma-based uh, parts and pieces, but it's also trying to make sure that we've got everything in place so that we are an attractive um, district for folks to move, move to. So what we were looking at as the cabinet sat down, kind of analyzed this data, is decided on the things that we needed to do and hopefully we're able to address with this next budget. Uh, we wanted to be able to mitigate the impact of the trauma-based behaviors. Um, we've got to examine our special education practices. You know, are we over accommodating? Are, are we doing things the best way that we can? Um, my guess is, is that we probably can do a little bit better. Um, and the reason that I say that is that most special education systems are set up to deal with students that have academic disabilities, which is what we're geared for. Um, and we are geared very well for that. Um, the problem is, is that a lot of the behaviors and a lot of the issues that we're dealing with are not academic. Yeah, they've got academic problems, but it's because of the trauma-based behaviors. Um, and so it's an examination of, of what we need to do to change, change those practices. Um, we've got to focus resources on the core competencies of math and ELA. Um, all the other disciplines uh, rely on student competency in math and in ELA. Okay? You've got to be able to read and write. And in most cases, especially when you hit the sciences or you hit the higher levels of any of the other disciplines, you have to have some mathematical or st statistical capabilities to be successful. Um, we've got to keep expanding the programming because we want to keep our enrollment numbers going up if we can. And then just address the impact that conservative funding has had. And it has had, had, has had an impact. Um, yes, you know, enrollments have gone down, but we kind of got a little bit into uh, a negative cycle where we lose things. And it's logical. You, you lose things. Things are not as attractive. So fewer people come, take advantage. So you lose more and just trying to break that cycle a little bit. Major additions for 2019-2020, um, things that this budget is going to help us help us do, um, is just getting a preschool offered in each town. Um, that's key. That's part of impacting those trauma-based behaviors that we see in students. Um, students that come into preschool are, are better prepared socially and academically for success in the later grades. Um, but they're also making the social connections and they're gaining resiliency skills that help them with the adversity that they may be facing in their lives outside of school. Um, so even though the trauma to some extent may still be going on, they're better able to cope and to deal with it so it doesn't have as much of an impact on their lives. Um, time to take a look um, at science and, and getting a science and STEM program in at the elementary level. Um, that work and kind of examining what that should be has already begun. Um, we've got the pre-tech offering um, that's coming up, something that you guys are going to be asked to vote on at the next meeting, allow the exploratory to begin happening um, for that. Um, putting in the therapeutic program um, that's serving the elementary level students across all three schools uh, to help mitigate these problems, to help the students learn how to self-regulate, how to soothe themselves. Um, so that they don't have to have somebody else do it for them. One of the reasons right now that working with these students uh, is so expensive um, is because the district has been relying on an old model. They have one-to-one -one paraprofessionals working directly with these students. We have 26 paraprofessionals in the district right now. Um, and they're great people. Uh, they do absolutely amazing work with the students. Um, but in some cases, it can be almost detrimental because what that person is doing when they're sitting there with a student is when a trigger happens or is about to happen, the outside person does the soothing and the, what they call it co-regulating with the student. And when that happens, the student is never learning those skills for themselves. And so over the course of time, uh, the students, at least at the elementary level, are able to, to be sustained in the school for the most part. Um, but in the end, they're not learning any skills 
um, to be able to do any of this for themselves. And so by the time they get to the high school, uh, when they don't have quite those supports in terms of the paraprofessionals, that's when we see them kind of burning out and going into outplacements. Um, increased staffing for intervention. Um, this is what I call fixing the gaps in knowledge, and this is for all students, not just students with disabilities. Um, we're looking and bringing in some staff to actually sit down uh, with these new programs that we have in place that will tell where the students are strong and where they're weak, and will tailor programs for them to fill in those gaps okay. to make sure that the students in the pipelines are getting what they need. Um, increasing staffing in some cases just because the enrollments are going up. Brookfield needs another regular education teacher. Brookfield should have its own um, principal as well. Um, so these are things that we're trying to address with the budget. Uh, they will get a regular education teacher next year. Um, in some major discussions uh, with the cabinet, um, what they're looking at is instead of another administrator is bringing in a behavioral specialist. Uh, because really what they need that principal there the full, full time for is when those kids blow out. If there's not an administrator there, the kid has to be contained in the, the classroom and it takes the whole classroom offline until the, the student is, is regulated. If we've got the behavioral interventionist, they can come down, kindly remove the student from the classroom, sit down process with the student and start building some of the skills they need to be able to regulate for themselves. Um, focusing resources on mathematics, uh, especially at the high school. Um, and that kind of goes along with our, our budget process change. When things were fairly con conservative um, through the budget process, um, one thing didn't happen as much. And that was actually communicating directly with the departments, you know, math department, English department, about what their needs were. Um, that happened this year. Um, and we are able to start addressing some of them. Um, the mathematics folks are looking at bringing in um, a coaching group that's been incredibly successful um, in, in larger districts to come in and work with them on practices uh, that will help this specific population of students here that they're working with. Um, so there's a, a lot that's going on uh, in terms of the academics as well. In terms of uh, the OSSD, where we're at and what we're looking for, um, we usually talk in terms of per student spending, and there's a couple of thresholds that folks need to be aware of. Um, this number may be adjusted with some of the wrangling that's going on in the legislative process right now and um, with wrangling that's going on with, around Act 46. But right now, for every student um, next year, from that education fund, which every town in the, the state uh, pays money into, the first $10,666 comes from that fund. So everybody across the state is subsidizing that first $10,66 for, for a student. Between this line and this line, the towns themselves that own the district pay a larger portion, but not all. 33% of the cost between these two lines um, actually come from all the towns around us. For us, it's about $4.4 million or so. Um, so what we're trying to do um, is we're trying to increase the budget enough to address these issues. Um, it's a one-time deal. Um, the intent is to go into what we call a level service uh, budget planning process afterwards. But to take our students um, right now, we're spending $15,600 per student on them, and get that spending up to 17,183, which is actually pretty close to a lot of the districts around us. Um, and to avoid and leave a big buffer between this mark right here, this 18,311, above that line, the towns pay for everything. Um, so we're trying to move things up, take advantage of the fact that we're getting a significant subsidy from the other towns in and around the state, um, while still not pushing it so high that we cross that net upper threshold. So budget increase from 16.6 million to 18.5 is what we're looking at. Um, it's an 11.2% increase. Um, it'll make a little bit more sense in a couple of slides when I show what the actual impact will be to taxpayers in the towns. Um, this keeps us below that, that critical spending threshold and it still provides a buffer, right? 10,028 per student buffer um, so that we're nowhere close to it, we can still increase the budget or a couple of a percent each year as we need to without having to worry about crossing that. Um, our student spending of our 15.6K would go to 17.1K per student. 
Um, and again, the big part is, is that in this range where we're doing the increase, the other towns across the state are subsidizing 33% of that increase. Questions? A lot and long, I know, but. There is also an income sensitivity threshold folks should be aware of. Um, basically, um, if your house is worth less than $400,000 and your household income is less than $90,000, you will not be getting hit for the full increase. Um, you do have to fill out a form for this. Um, it's available um, on the tax website for the state of Vermont. Um, but it can adjust your property tax downwards up to $8,000 this year. So again, if you're in that income sensitivity threshold range, you will be paying something less. Bottom line for Brookfield, and we've got some assumptions here. Um, we're assuming in these numbers that the average home value in Vermont, which I pulled off the uh, Vermont Realtors website, is $201,400. Um, if that's the case, that means the average tax increase for the year would be $274.2279 a month um, is what it would be. Um, again, if you're in that income sensitivity threshold range, then this will be less than that if you apply for it. In terms of Braintree, um, average tax increase would be $215. And in Randolph, average tax increase would be 221. Again, important to kind of point a few things out. The intent of this, it's a one-time correction. You know, people have done a, an awesome job here of being very conservative um, in the budgeting process over time. Um, we're at a point where we've got some needs um, and we want to be able to address those needs, but the goal is, is to have that correction and then after this, we move into what we call a level service funding model. So in a level service funding model, what that means is that we increase the budget each year just enough to not lose ground. Right. You know, we talked about that. Salaries are going up. Um, what we're trying to supply to programs and whatnot to keep those up and running and, and to supply for the kids um, is here. We want to make sure that this doesn't change. That piece always stays the same. So that's the idea of the level service funding model. And it is a very successful model um, in other states. Um, if the budget does not pass, um, that therapeutic program is critical. Um, we will have to shift resources to do that. Um, Brookfield, um, it needs its staff. Um, they probably should have had, had the, at least one of those staff members this year. Um, they will get their staff one way or another. And then in terms of facilities, uh, there are some things that have to happen in terms of facilities. Um, and we will be shifting things around to make sure that those happen. There was a lot of maintenance work um, for whatever reason over the course of time that didn't get done. Um, and some of it has become critical, um, which means that if we don't fix it, we're gonna have some huge cost to have to replace stuff. Um, so we're trying to accelerate that maintenance process, get things back up on the regular cycle that it should be. and then. These costs, what we're putting into, re into the facilities, um, will decrease. You know, hopefully that's a year or two we get stuff up where it should be, and then we can kind of pull off on, on it again. In terms of the resources that are going to the therapeutic program, um, one of the things to recognize is that there is money being spent right now maintaining the current program, the paraprofessionals. we got to get the therapeutic program in place, and then once this starts doing its work, we can start to pull back on the number of paraprofessionals that we have. Um, and so we'll be able to shift those costs either back to the community or to, to other places um, that's needed within the district. So are the therapeutic programs in each of the elementary schools? You'll have three? I'd love to. Um, are you having, we have one. It's going to be one, and it, but it's mm -hmm. open to students from all. Mm -hmm. um, and so what they'll do is they'll take a peek um, at the students that are there, they'll see what the needs are, they'll triage them. Mm -hmm. Highest priority goes first. Okay. So. They'll all be centrally located. Yeah. And they won't be forced. Um, you know, part of the, the agreement with the parents is this is, you know, if you're in Brookfield or you're in Braintree and your student could benefit from this, mm -hmm. 
and is, is, is at that point on the triage list if the parents agree, you know, for the student to, to attend Randolph um, to take advantage of the program they're in um, as part of it. The, again, the only reason not to do it at the three is it's, ex it's a very expensive program. I've right. too. Same thing with the preschool. Right. Preschool is hugely right. expensive. Um, a couple of words on the preschool is there is the therapeutic piece to it. Um, but another piece of it is that's developed over the last couple of months um, in talking with the R3 group in town, right, the, the, the reinvigorate Randolph, mm -hmm. um, is they have been for years trying to get um, child care into the town. So part of that group is working on the zero to two age group. Um, they actually have a site that they're looking at. Uh, mm -hmm. They're trying to get seed funding for that to get that up and running. Um, and then hopefully the schools, um, as part of its work you with know, the students of trauma, will be taking care of ages three to four. That's so how do, you, how do you currently, with what you offer for preschool and brain tree, how are you able to identify those kids that are most in need? And then can you say that you captured 90 to 95% of those kids in brain tree that are really in need, trauma-based, and they are actually going to preschool right now? We have, in terms of um, Braintree, we had the capacity with what was built um, that we have students there from other towns as well. A lot of Brookfield um, students are going. Right, I know. So in other words, we have the capacity to take all the students that, that needed preschool. Um, all students in the in the district from all three towns from that, 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 for that all. wanted, yep, yeah, that were willing. And, and so I'm asking not just those that wanted or maybe those that um, are employed by the district that yep. have children that are going there, but those that are trauma-based, that we're saying that are in need, are you able to recognize those and capture them and bring them in? Yep. And there's capacity for them and then the overflow from the other yeah. areas as well. And the hope, the hope for like Brookfield is to get there. Um, we started off at Braintree where we have the part day that's public. Mm -hmm. Um, the full day piece, there's a cost associated mm -hmm. with it now. We actually cobbled that together without having the budget to do it. Um, I was able to pull some from, from title grants and whatnot mm -hmm. to get it into place this year. Um, the goal is over the course of time um, is to make all of those programs to build them up to the point where it's full public preschool for all kids. Mm -hmm. So the hope is if the therapeutic program starts doing its job, if we can start to see, see some savings because of that, um, with this money that we're asking mm -hmm. for, is to start shifting it to other places. And the biggest place right now is to try to fund that preschool. Brookfield next mm -hmm. year will be will be part day, um, and hopefully we can build on it and build on it because they are extremely expensive. The preschools to build. There's a limited number of students you can have. You have to have the two adults in there. There's right, there's specific a lot facility of complexity to it, and then location, location, location. Yeah. Right, accessibility after the half day. Yep. Those parents that are actually able to pick up a child. And then we got part way through the day, and it's probably pretty likely that those that are trauma based are, don't have that same accessibility yep. or the privilege of that. So I guess what I'm trying to get down to is, do we have everyone? Are we capturing the whole population, or is it really those parents that have the accessibility, the relatives to rely on, the transportation, et cetera, that are able to take advantage of that currently? Or are we really getting those that we are most wanting to? getting them access to, to preschool? Uh, right here and now, I would say a combination of both. They had prioritized mm -hmm. at Braintree for, for students that were in severe need and were able to mm -hmm. go out and help them find the subsidies mm -hmm. um, so that the parents Good. could afford. Um, mm -hmm. The other piece that, that comes up, and again, as the program grows, we see what problems we encounter and we adjust to them. Mm -hmm. um, it is possible to use title funding for transportation. So that is a possibility, you know, you can apply for it, it it's something mm -hmm. that, that they can agree to, um, and that would be a possibility if the need, need is, is there once we get stuff up and running. And you, so you're, you have that in Braintree, and what is the status of the one in Randolph at this point? Is that the So Randolph is, is morning, morning and afternoon, mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting, yeah, mm -hmm. and what's interesting about them, um, and that actually has to do a little bit with the grades uh, as well. Um, talk on the grade piece first is, you know, this is for three and four year olds. The four year olds, the goal is to have a full day public for all four year olds. 
Um, the three-year-olds are still kind of young. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do, you could put them in, in a full day, but they're probably going to benefit a little, little bit more um, for, for the partial day. Um, but the other piece that goes along with this to make it open to as many parents as possible and why it was fairly successful at, at Braintree um, was because of the after-school program that went with it. Mm -hmm. Because like you say, you know, there's a difficulty in dropping off and picking up. Um, if they're able to pick up their children um, along the same lines that coincide with their work hours, it's better. Mm -hmm. It works better for Makes everybody. Sense. Um, so the after-school program is a big, big piece to it. But again, we're build, building a kind of patchwork as we can mm -hmm. with, with the money that we've it's got available. It's definitely a challenge for the smaller schools to be able to do that and yep. sustain it. And part of it, what's, what's nice about the Brookfield is that we've mm -hmm. got it up and running. Um, it seems like there's a huge need for it. I mean, we've got people on the waiting list um, at Randolph at mm -hmm. times um, for, the, for the partial day. Um, but it'll give us kind of a litmus test on, on you know, how many people are actually going to access it. Mm -hmm. We put it in full full bore the first year, and we only are filling up uh, you know a third of the capacity. Right, right. You just don't know at this point. Yeah. Okay. So it's probably, you know, what we didn't do it that way by design. We'd like to go full bore if we could, but mm -hmm. you know we're we're patching it together with the finances mm -hmm. that we have, and hoping over the course of time, if the need is there, is that we can start to shift. Mm -hmm. you know, I expect the therapeutic <laughs> therapeutic will take. Um, I shouldn't say an impact in a year, but find a, a, a big financial impact if the program is in there and is successful, you know, probably two to three day, years down the road, you're going to see some money, large money that we can shift over to other things. Mm -hmm. Questions? A couple of final notes here um, that are important. Um, one of the things, and it's a shame that it actually happened this year when we're asking for a large increase, um, is that all the schools get federal grant monies. Um, this is the first year that they are requiring the schools to actually put that in their budgets to show people what the federal government is giving us. And so it's going to make it look like what we're asking for from the towns in the state of Vermont is much bigger than it is. Right? This, is not, this is money that comes from the federal government. Yeah, it comes from your federal taxes. Um, but it comes from the federal government. It does not have a, a local impact. So that 18.5 million budget that we're looking for is actually going to be looking like 19.4 because we have to include those, those grant totals in there as well. A um, couple of other things that are kind of important is the surplus funds. Um, people were asking questions about that. Um, we have a, a fairly consistent um, turnover rate in terms of, of staff. So a lot of this is since we're budgeting a year in advance, um, we're budgeting for who our current staff are now. So if we get a number that retire, and we hire folks that are lower on the pay scale, there's a surplus. And so the majority of the surpluses um, that have happened over, over the course of time have happened because of that mechanism. Um, the other mechanism that's in there that's a little bit smaller is how we get reimbursements from the state. Um, in some cases, we have to plan for costs up front. They come from the taxpayers and our, our budgets. And then at the end of the year, we're reimbursed um, from the state. For those. Uh, a lot of those have to do with special education costs. So questions or? And I'll get the, um, like I said, I'm gonna talk with Robin. Uh, first thing in the morning, we'll get the, the, the freshest numbers up there. Um, in, term, website, in terms of the line page. item, uh, line item piece, um, mm -hmm. and uh, that way folks can take a look. And I'll try to get her to do it with like a three-year comparison. So is this a wrap for your presentation? Yeah, unless you unless you've got questions. So then I guess I guess um, a question would be in terms of you've got this kind of all mapped with the trauma-based and um, the increase that you're seeking. Are there are there things um, next year that you're projecting um, as cuts? Is there something that will be cut? Do we have programs at the high school? Or um, the, the any of that that's been cut? Or that's all the same? The intent was not to cut anything. Mm -hmm. um, and part of it was to accommodate the fact that we've got 50, 55 new students mm -hmm. um, that we didn't have before um, when the current budget that we're in, in was planned. Um, and the hopes that, again, we want to make this as attractive as possible, um, the hopes that we're going to capture more of those school choice students. 
um, is Here's the goal. Here's advanced placements are there. You'll have a variety of electives. Yep. So unaffected. Okay. Matter of fact, you know, high school, the, the one big target from this um, is a what we call a tier two coordinator. Um, the high school has a lot of programs here to help all students that maybe struggle a little bit. You know, all students struggle. The, the, the top ones to, 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 to the middle, middle ones and whatnot. Um, and they all need help from time to time. So they've got like Project Achieve, they've got the learning labs, um, they've got the callback periods, they've got the IST process. Um, what they really need, especially in terms of the IST process, is somebody to come in and oversee it and keep real close track of the students, making sure that the ones that should be getting into those services are getting the pressure to get into. Right, and, and it's IST? Uh, everybody uses different names for it. Um, it's part of uh, what, what I call RTI, Response to Intervention. Um, it was a law that came out probably a decade and a half ago um, relative to special education that said districts have a responsibility to child find, um, to look out at their student populations, find who is struggling, mm -hmm. and help them um, mm -hmm. with these programs. And not put them on an IEP, help them, but mm -hmm. provide them with, with basic, good, best practice mm -hmm. services um, mm -hmm. so that they can see. And the goal was kind of twofold. One was it was to try to prevent over accommodation students from, from getting mislabeled as, as students with disabilities who really didn't have disabilities um, was the first piece. And I'm losing it here because it's been, been, been a long, long night. Um, oh, what was the second piece? I talk about this all the time. It'll come back, it'll come back to me. But that's the, but that's the purpose of the RTI. Um, it's really it's to provide services for the regular education students as well, um, mm -hmm. get them what they need, so hopefully they don't end up on an IEP at some mm -hmm. time in the future and be mislabeled. Yeah, and you know there was the, the there was the budget savings portion to it. Um, if you're over accommodating students, um, not only is it a violation of the civil their civil rights, it's also costly. Mm -hmm. um, and try to try to get the cost to come down a bit. That's a good question. You're making me think too. I think that's it for my questions tonight. Yeah, so uh, high school, no cuts. Um, the, the one addition um, individual is that, that tier two coordinator that they're looking for for next year. Um, they are working with uh, the tech center on that pre-tech program. Yeah, I was interested to hear more on the pre-tech, and that actually reminds me, um, the curriculum, curriculum coordinator, someone who oversees curriculum, do you have that as a component or a basis of one of the current admins? I mean, that was talked about last year. So, so the, the structure that's in, in place right now, and that's why those, uh, those coaches that we talked about a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. those instructional coaches, mm -hmm. um, they are actually kind of playing the role of uh, kind of what you would call a curriculum director along with, with Katie um, okay. Sutton at the high school. Um, so they are doing a lot of work with the departments um, and the teachers to improve practice. Okay. Um, a significant amount of work this year has been around kind of examining student data, mm -hmm. you know, taking a look, okay, so what information can we collect to tell us where the students are weak and where they're strong and, you know, how can right, we capitalize you're on doing, that? Kind of looking at that. Yeah, and then in terms of the director piece, I've been serving a little bit of that role um, with the digital literacy mm -hmm. um, piece as well as the work that's going on in special education. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's instead of having one embodiment of it, you know, mm -hmm. there's there's a, a group of us that are all kind of acting out that function. Um, but that's a, a part of it. I don't know if you guys ever had a curriculum director in the past or an assistant superintendent. Um, but that's, you know, when I, when I look across, you know, the, what typically is in a district, you know, that's one of the pieces that's usually there. Um, but they are expensive. Um, it's a tough position if you have them because it's usually the first position that's cut if budgets go south. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so then what do you do yeah. in the event that something like that you have that and it's cut? You've got to yep. fill the gap somewhere else. So. And so we've got the instructional so coaches in there. We've pulled them out, out of title um, and put them onto the um, into the regular budget so that we know they're secure. Um, they're here. They can continue to do the work. Um, you know, regardless of at least what happens and with their funding. Questions?
feel like I'm putting you on the spot? No, I've had, I've asked some questions in prior years around technology related courses, computer science, I think I'd asked Brent Kay about a couple of years ago. I don't see it at the high school so list Josh as an is, offering. Um, Josh is actually um, working on developing a coding class mm -hmm. that, that might eventually evolve into like an AP computer science. Mm -hmm. um, so that's in the works right now, mm -hmm. um, as well as the statistics course. Those are two mm -hmm. pieces that are missing, so he's very excited about that. And even just exposing students to that, yep. so it's not um, a glaring gap as they approach well, the college. Goal, the goal is to have really two classes next year. Mm -hmm. um, is the goal. Okay. And that's part of what I was talking about on the instructional piece is really having those discussions on the budget come up from the department level. Mm -hmm. um, because typically costs for departments, you know, if they're looking to, to build a new program or they need some professional mm -hmm. development that they've identified when they're looking through their student data, that's cheap compared to, you know, bringing in new staff. Um, it's, it's incredibly cost effective and incredibly effective. Um, so having those conversations in the mix this year has, has been really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what I, what I saw, not so much here, but when you get a level funded district, um, what will happen in those districts is that because it's level funded, nobody talks about the budget because you know what you're getting. Um, so there's no real, it's, it's unfortunate because there's no real planning that goes on. Uh, they don't get into those, those deep discussions about, you know, where are we doing well, where are we struggling, where should, where should our focus be. Right, and so we've got the balance of those folks who really want to teach things because that's what they can't afford to do is, is pay that. And you've got other folks who are like, hey, I've got it and I... I'll fund what's necessary. So it's the balance between those two, but it's also looking at whether it's a curriculum director, whomever, what's relevant right now. Yeah. And so I have been out of college for a lot of years, but I know computer science was, that was my freshman year, first class, no exposure. So it's very shocking to me to be here at RU and that hasn't been brought on or introduced yeah. in the 20 plus years since then. So. Yeah. That's one example. I'm sure there's okay. a lot of other technology related or other courses that could be of benefit to students, exposure and the like. Yeah. So it's good to know that the department heads are looking at that and reaching out, I guess, at this point. Yeah. If that's, that, that's, that's, part of, that's part of the, 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 you know, the, the building piece that's going on right now. I mean, they were kind of addressing it a little bit, you know, the makerspace, that was a good one of the reasons mm -hmm. that that came in on board because that is pretty high tech. Mm -hmm. um, if you're ever around and you want to go down mm -hmm. and, and, and see the spot when Ken's here, it's, it's, it's beautiful mm -hmm. the work that they do in there. I get a seventh grade that's in it. Uh, yeah, yeah the, the, uh, it's kind of funny. They, they've, the 3D printers, um, the seventh and eighth grade team is actually learning mm -hmm. how to do the coding for mm -hmm. that. So they, there is, they're, they're integrating it, uh, but it, it's nice that Josh has been, been talking about and is really passionate about putting in those two classes next year. Um, so, and we had talked about that. It came down because uh, when again we were we were trying to as unreasonable as it seems we were trying to get a, a, a what we needed out of the budget without being excessive. And one of the questions that came up on the coding and the statistics was, hey, um, you know, we'd really like to run this class, but do we need another staff member to do it? And then we talked, and it's like, well, you've got these. You've got these, these labs um, that mm -hmm. appear when you look at the data to be really effective with the seventh and eighth graders, but not so much with the older students. Instead of having teachers man those labs, pull the teachers back, work with them on mm -hmm. you know, developing and putting those courses into place. That's kind of where they settled. Okay. Other questions? Or? That's what I've got. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah. So we can adjourn at uh, 7.50.